and invite uh, Ann Berg, president and partner of CTQ, to bring greetings to everybody and get to get us started. Good afternoon, evening, everyone. I am uh, delighted to see um, some returning faces uh, to this series of webinars CTQ has been honored to uh, sponsor and you guys are in for a real treat um, this evening. We are so delighted to have Emily Vickery with us um, to lead uh, tonight's session. Emily has been a longtime uh, CTQ friend and contributor and was one of the first folks to step up and say, um, count me in, I would love to be part of work to help um, my fellow professionals um, navigate this uncharted territory we all find ourselves in. So we are so thrilled that um, we are finally um, at Emily's uh, webinar day and date and we're looking forward to um, learning from and with Emily this afternoon. And I know Lori's going to share just a little bit more about CTQ for those of you who are um, newcomers to um, our world of work so you can learn a little more about us and um, it's just so great to see so many familiar faces on, on the screen this evening and we're looking forward to spending the the next hour with you so thanks so much for joining us Lori all right um, hello everybody lots of familiar faces in the room and a few new folks so uh, for those of my name is Lori Nazarino. I'm a former educator of 25 years and now working at CTQ on a full-time basis and have the honor and privilege of being able to engage um, with folks like you. So I'm going to share here with you. Uh oh, what the heck? Okay, are you all seeing the PowerPoint, seeing PowerPoint slides? Nope. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. See what happened. Try this again. <laughs> Can you see them now? Okay, so uh, just a quick overview of CTQ. CTQ stands for Center for Teaching Quality, and we ground our work around informing, inspiring, and innovating around education to create a, a system that works better for all students. And we really focus our attention on informing the field based on research and the real lived experience of practicing educators like those of you in the room. We do a number of things, including webinars like this that hopefully inspire those of you in the room to innovate. And then in, when we have the opportunity to partner with districts, unions, state agencies, and other organizations, we work with those partners to encourage innovation, again, to create a system that works better for all students. A quick reminder for folks that if you're not on the microphone, if you would mute your microphone so we can minimize background noise. And I will go ahead and introduce Emily Vickery. Like Anne said, a long time CTQ community member who has more expertise than anyone I know <laughs> in this area of online learning crisis in this case crisis learning and what we're dealing with now and um, as we said practicing educator and the most important thing for educators to learn and hear from are other practicing educators so i'm going to get myself out of the way and hand this over to emily so that she can get us started emily um, the honor is mine. Uh, I tell you, I just, um, gosh, it's been so long since I connected through CTQ. I remember Barnett Berry in 1995 coming to Montgomery, Alabama to promote uh, teacher leadership. And so I've been a part hook, line, and sinker sink every, ever since. And I'm just so grateful for all of the connections I've made, the professionalism, and it keeps me sane. And I think a lot of folks in CTQ would agree with that. I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I may be facilitating this workshop, but uh, I'm here to listen to you as well. I'm here to share some stories, but I also want to hear yours. As already has been stated, we do live in unprecedented times and we are all in this, uh, even though online learning's been around for quite some time, 
we have been tackling this head on as a group. So we're going to approaching this as a discussion and hopefully to model some of the things that you're already doing and maybe to spark something, an idea that you hadn't thought of it. Um, such talent in the room already. So I'm looking forward to diving in. So if we could go, I think, Laurie to the polls, I think. So one of the things that um, we're doing tonight is we're taking a poll. I think many of you have already been using polls in your classroom. You can use them for any number of uh, academic reasons or even just to get to know your students a little bit more. So via these polls, I'm going to ask you to just answer a few quick questions and then we'll take a look together. So Emily, just let me know when you want me to close it. We now have 15 of 19 folks and I know I didn't respond. <laughs> okay, well, sure, that would be great. <laughs> Let's close those out, thank you. Those are the first two. Oh, share results. So when we look at this, I mean, I get a snapshot of who's in the room and what's great about it is so do you. Um, it's 20%, none of us, 20% very little, 13% some, a decent amount. Yes, we're gonna be listening heavily to that 27 and 20% of a lot and a decent amount for you to bring your expertise in. Um, I can't quite see the rest of those polls, Lori. Um, do you want the uh, want me to put the other two up now? Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Sure. And you know, I have a can I have the cameras here, but I also have a screen over to the right. So I'm with you. It's just I may be scribbling back and forth. <clears throat> there you go. There are the questions three and four. Okay. Give a few more seconds to answer the polls. We've got 66% voted. And I think we can end that poll, Lori. Okay. Interesting. The, one of the reasons I asked this question about um, if students have laptops or other mobile devices is just to see, um, we have you know, just a snapshot to see what students have available to them. And of course, what uh, different devices teachers have to prepare to, for in uh, virtual environments. We have, it looks like 42% um, grades six through eight, K through two, 17%. I'd love to, to learn from the uh, early grades teachers how, what you guys are doing, because I know I've been getting a lot of questions and that's not my area of expertise. So I look forward to 
to learning from that as to well as everyone. Thank you. I think we can stop the sharing the polls at this time. When, um, when I first started thinking about how, what type of language to, to structure the conversation around, I went back to that curriculum <laughs> instruction assessment. And of course, you know, we've always looked at that in a linear fashion. Um, but of course, but what we've done over the years is we all know that it's really circular because instruction, content, instruction, and assessment take place in a circular vein. I shifted the language slightly um, just to have more of a context for virtual learning. So I used the verbiage of content creation and then interactions and then assessment. But no, the reason it's in that circle is because they are going to overlap. So you'll see the bracket to the right is that when we talk about some of these areas, you'll, especially the approach or the tool or the outcome, you'll see that they will overlap. So the first area we're going to look at on the next slide will be content creation. So one of the things that um, in content creation that, we, that I've been looking at was a vast array of what we want to do. And of course, we are all teachers and good teaching is good teaching regardless of where it is. And of course, what we have to do is just make, be flexible and make adjustments. As always, planning backward, the beautiful work of Grant Wiggins and McTie, um, that backward design, those long range plans are still very important. And then what I've discovered in, in my short experience at, in, as an online instructor for, for in the K-12, I've taught adults, but what I've learned is to use what there's a phrase some of you may have heard is called micro learning or what we've known for decades is called instruction in chunks. So you've got to really take that long range plan, back it out and then do more so in chunks. We have to ask ourselves the same questions. What will students actually do um, in a virtual environment? We have to go beyond reading, listening and viewing. So some of the things that, uh, and again, I'd like to hear from you, are infographs or write a summary, create a vid video, diagram a process. Those are some of the ideas we have. Um, Lori, do you think it's time to show them the doc, to crowdsource the doc? I shall leave that, leave that to you. Do you, want, <laughs> okay. do you want to do that now? Okay. I think, I think so. Um, you'll see we've used polls and I'm trying to actually model uh, some areas I've used already. I call it crowdsourcing a Google Doc. My, my students have really enjoyed it. Um, it does twofold. It does two things. So I question, I, I just taught into the wild and what we did is we put up some study guide questions in a Google Doc. The link is public and so we share it to the kids and they're probably about 20 questions. I don't assign them. I say, go in, dive in, find a question you want to answer. And then I do ask them to put their names there. The reason is because you'll hear over and over again, oh, you can go back into the history of a Google Doc and you can see who did this and that and how much time they spent. But in the long run, teachers don't have time to go back into that history. So it also helps once they put their name by their contribution, I know to call on them to elaborate that answer. So this crowdsourcing of the Google Doc is one thing I really enjoy and also it ends up being the study guide for the student. So Emily, I'll go ahead and stop and sh stop sharing this slide and then go ahead and share that crowdsourcing doc. Right. And Jessica has dropped the link into the chat box. So everybody now has access to it. So when you um, copy and paste that link, Zoom hasn't made them click. For whatever reason, they're not clickable anymore. So 
if you're new to this, copy and paste that link and enter it. And then you'll, you should see this document that I'm sharing now. So uh, as we crowdsource your ideas. Emily. And of course, um, as we're crowdsourcing these ideas and we're talking about content creation, please share some strategies in that doc that you've been using as well. You may use a variety of multimedia resources. If you could tell us what those specific resources may be that you find valuable. Um, you may use interactive Google Maps or Google Lit Trips, for example. You may use Google Forms as an exit ticket to check for comprehension. Might use a whiteboard to illustrate ideas. I'm just curious as to see what, what you guys have experienced. That's a great idea, Marsha, um, to color code and also font style. So you've got 34 plus when you need everything. Wonderful suggestion. And Emily, did you want folks to put their if, if email you could, address if they were willing to be contacted about? Or yes, if you're other? willing, again, what we're doing is we're building our personal network of connections. So if you would please put your name in there and email address if you would like to be contacted. And we'll be returning to this document during um, during this session, so. We'll spend a couple of more minutes. You guys, this is amazing. All these strategies and resources. Thank you so much. Alicia, very good. <laughs> so um, there is so much in here. And what's wonderful is, you know, usually after a Zoom, we always say, be sure to save the chat because that's where all the resources and the strategies and the techniques are housed. Well, with this, you'll have access to this. Um, I've also found in professional development, this is really super helpful. Um, because yes, you may record things, but you may not always have time to go back and listen to the recording or go through a chat to pull out those plums. But when you have a Google Doc, it's easier to see if you've structured the questions that you can go back through and pull out those specific resources. Um, at this point in the participant panel, if you like this idea of crowdsourcing, whether for professional learning or with students. If you could raise your participant hand in the participant panel. Just like to kind of get the temperature of the room here.
you can use the okay you can use the reaction button at the bottom with a thumbs up or a clap or if you feel more comfortable go on the participant panel and and raise your hand i kind of wish zoom had a thumbs down because sometimes when i want to take and really understand what's going on with the kids out there um i would like to say do i really understand no <laughs> Otherwise, it will be partly cloudy or below around 47 degrees. Oh, okay. Okay, Marsha or Azatol. Yep, okay, Ralph. So that, I think this is really beneficial to have um, something, a document like this. Again, we can all use it for various purposes. I don't know what, if there's a name for it. I call it crowdsourcing for learning. Um, Again, my students use it for study guides once we've done a book study and for other numerous reasons. Um, the other thing too I wanted to mention before we leave content creation, and again, as we said, you know, there's that circular piece where they're all connected. Um, anybody use Adobe Spark out there? I'm just curious because it is, yeah, it's awesome, Noah. Um, Noah, could you speak a little bit about uh, Adobe Spark, what you think about it? Um, Adobe Spark's really good for a variety of uses. Uh, if you need to create an infographic, it's just as powerful or good as, say, a Canva or a picture chart or anything like that. Um, but if you're looking for a different way to deliver content that is not um, Google Slides or um, whatever the one that everybody was using for a while or you've zoomed in and out, I can't think of what it was called, um, it's a really great way to deliver content in a way that's just more visually engaging. Um, and it allows you to embed a whole host of different tools. It's really, it's really a very strong tool. It's online, so it's not an application that has to be on the, in the hard drive. So it's uh, web accessible. Um, you can do character boards, you can do memes, um, you can even create your own logo. Um, you can also create badges. Uh, so students can create their own, and we can create our own badges um, as well, using that as well. Um, now, I did want to talk to you a little bit about just an, a couple of examples. I, I'm currently teaching uh, rhetoric in logos, pathos, and ethos. And so one of the things I did was to show commercials, and then we had to go through the different types of bandwagon, um, popular people, that type of thing. So one of the things I asked them to do was to create their own commercial. Now, and again, that's content creation, but it's also used as a piece of assessment. You could use Adobe Spark for that as well, as, as Noah pointed out, it's a very powerful piece. Okay, um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. So again, here, um, oh great, Noah's got Spark for PBL. I, I get so taken with the chat that I really should pay attention to what I'm doing here. Um, course interactions. We already started crowdsourcing that document, but what I'd like to just get kick-started here are, um, again, because it overlaps a little bit, but what are some course interactions? What do students do with you? What do students do by themselves? What do students do with other students? So for example, they may use Google Drive to collaborate. They may use Box or Skype or other web-based games. They may be designing individual or group projects, trivia games or board games. Um, if we could go back to the crowdsourcing document and see, it looks like we've already got a number of interactions in there as well. So but let's go back and see if any of the men, anything we've mentioned so far has sparked any other input there. What I think is so interesting, like one of the things that struck me right away in this first question was there's input from the macro level about how people are shifting entire systems to be more competency-based. 
everything down to something more micro, like one-on-one -on -one interactions and relationships with kids. So it just, it kind of, you know, just the scale of the ideas that were captured in this um, amount of time from those different levels is, is kind of amazing. Um, what I wanted, speaking of course interactions, <clears throat> um, I know we have one, you know, all, each class has its own personality, right? Um, so if you have that good group of kids that you're not worried about, you may want to turn on the, per, the chat box, right? Then again, there are some that I'm a little skeptical about that I would turn the chat box on or off. Um, can anybody speak to turning it, how, did, that you prefer to keep it on or to turn it off? Anybody like to talk about that choice that you have with students? And just a reminder for folks to un remember to unmute yourself if you're going <laughs> to speak so we can all hear what you have to say. <laughs> Hi, um, I teach kindergarten in New Jersey. And so when I do my Google Meets, um, I do not like my children to use the chat feature. I find it distracting and I am, you know, I only have so much time. They have a very short attention span. And I find that, you know, doing it on, by myself, um, it's easier for me to just get to my objective, go through the lesson because, you know, kids like to hijack, I'll call it, the meetings. Um, my higher students definitely will type into the chat box. I was playing sight word bingo. They were telling me what words that they wanted me to tell them for bingo. So I just stopped even looking at the chat because they were literally telling me to give them the answer. Um, but if it was something that I felt worthwhile, I would allow it. But, um, and maybe in time I will, but I think like, you know, just for my age, it's not something that I've been um, using. The parents will type into it sometimes, but I have to pay attention, but not so much the kids. I think it's a lot for them as well. Just everything is getting to them, so. I have elected to turn off the chat box and I teach high school kids um, just because just for some of the very same reasons Melanie just described is it's a distraction and plus I'm not sure what they're saying in that chat box but I want them more focused on uh, me so that's what I prefer. Um, uh, one of the reasons I turn off the chat when they start going like this and they start going like this I was like oh trouble and you just can't keep up with that chat box the dynamic sometimes as well Now you can turn the chat box off and on of course depending on if you do want to do a collaborative exercise or you do it. Um, I didn't even know you could turn it off You can you can turn the chat box feature off great to know. Thank you it will be in your settings, your, I believe it would be your online settings. It may be in your zoom.us settings for the application itself, but I know it's on your um, web based and somebody may know more about that than I do. But yeah, yes, ma'am, you can turn it off. Um, yeah, I actually so use Google Meets though. I don't know if that's uh, available. We're not allowed to use Zoom actually. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with Google Meets. I'll look into it, but thank you. I definitely will look at that now. Yes, ma'am. Marsha, you were holding something up. I couldn't read that. Oh, I have eighth graders who are not responsible enough. They can, but they shouldn't use the chat box, if you know what I mean. So they uh, will prepare like note cards and they'll write a response on several of them. And it's awesome because it's so much fun. You ask a question and they're frantically looking for their note card and they're holding it up and it makes it kind of, you know, frantic and, you know, they're middle school kids. So anything that kind of feels a little like a game, um, but it lets them respond without having them use their chat box. And then ultimately I can always turn off their video if they are holding up a sign that's inappropriate. <laughs> That's so brilliant, Marcia, and it makes me think of all the research about handwriting anyway, right? So now we, we're in this situation where kids are doing so much more typing and screen time, you know, like the power of writing a note card could actually feel really satisfying for other reasons too. 
Uh, yeah, and I teach science, so I might say something like, draw me a picture of a graph that shows a positive relationship from the variable on the y and the x-axis, and then they have to draw a picture, and then they hold their little note card up. So there's a lot of easy ways to, to do it and engage them, but not have them on the chat box. And the, and the whiteboard, too. Do you allow them to use the whiteboard, Marcia, sometimes, or...? Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. Can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. So I, this is what I put in the chat box. Anita Archer, and this is not exactly what she had, but she talked about a piece of notebook paper and you have the kids create it. So it's like A, B, C, D. So you'd have a point to whatever their answer is to a multiple choice question. Yes and no was on there, true and false. And she talked about having kids use like dinner plates and dry erase markers for like a whiteboard that they might manipulate. And my only fear with that was little ones, depending on where they're doing that. If they drop that dinner plate, there might be a mess for mom and dad to clean up and one less dinner plate in the house. But those were some ideas that she shared at a webinar that I attended of hers back probably three, four weeks ago. That's awesome. Now, I know uh, all of us are probably using a different LMS. So that's a learning management system. It could be like Google, you know, Google Classroom, Canvas, Haiku, Power School Learning. Um, it can be a, a, num a number of those. Uh, I use Haiku, which I adore. Um, I've gone through a lot of LMSs. I'm sure all of us has as, as well. Um, Gabe likes Schoolology. Uh, so in those features, you do have a quick, not only for polls, you can also have tests, real quick quizzes as formative and summative assessments. I guess we should move on to the next slide, Lori, for assessments because it seems like we've transitioned into that at this point. Again, some great examples of formative assessments as you go along holding up the cards and the flashcards and paper plates and such. Um, but don't overlook discussions. Um, many of your LMSs will have discussions. You can put a quick question in and get a quick response on the discussion boards. Um, I like to create quick quizzes in my LMS that when I use Haiku and it does, it instantly grades. So you may have that option in your LMS or not, I'm not sure. Um, under assessments two, I'd like to, um, again, as we said, this is, the circular path of content creation, interaction, and assessments. I'd mentioned before that my students uh, created commercials based on the rhetorical devices. So we're going to watch a commercial and a student example of one she created. question did it did the screen follow me so you're seeing a picture for the video okay do you miss spending time with your friends of course you do COVID-19 is an outbreak of a fast spreading virus affecting the lives of many worldwide the map demonstrated shows how fast this virus spreads so you should quarantine just like everyone else when outside, for necessities, it is important you use a mask and disinfectants to prevent any exposure. And always stay six feet apart. If we want change, we have to act fast and stay home for a decrease in cases. The faster we all quarantine, the sooner we get to see our friends again. I don't know, uh, the, the video didn't play for me. I don't know if it didn't play for other people. It didn't play, um, but it's a, it's a beautiful commercial that this student put together and it was so well designed, very thoughtful, so that that um, piece was, she got it. She got the logos, she got the pathos, she did the ethos. Um, so boom, her grade was extremely high. She hit all the buttons on that assessment but it was also an interaction because they also worked with each other. Um, if we could, oh, I wanted to, before we leave assessments, just a couple of more things. 
I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I, I use zip grade um, with printed papers and then you grade it from your phone. I guess a number of you have used that. Um, it took the place of Scantron sheets pretty much overnight. Uh, although I kind of still miss hearing that, <laughs> you know, as it goes through the machine. Um, but the ZipGrade just released a new set of features to al allow students to take ZipGrade assessments remotely using a web browser. And it's available on all accounts, whether it's paid and free, and there are no limits on the online submission. So some of you who had been using uh, ZipGrade before, you may want to look into that now that they've made it uh, web-based, which I thought was quite interesting. And again, when we go into the assessment piece, we looked at some formative assessment. And then, of course, we talked a little bit about summative assessments where you can have um, short answer and essays included as well. I'm sure it's just like we've always done, right? It's just a different way of doing it. And then if uh, a few tips, yes, ma'am, we could go into a few tips. Now, we've got some people in the room who have more experience uh, teaching online than I do. So I'm sure you have a, a range of tips to share. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about virtual backgrounds and why I don't allow them with my students. You may allow them. Um, but I knew that I had a um, political powder keg in one of my classes and it did happen. You had a picture of Trump and then you had a picture of Obama in the background and I just said, nope, and I already laid the ground, no, no virtual backgrounds because they're too explosive. You're not quite sure what a child may put up. Again, that's up to you. Um, and then if I do, if there's some teachers I know who allow virtual backgrounds, but they don't allow the movement of a virtual background because that can be very distracting to some. So just a few tips there. Um, also, I wanted to mention text and slides. Uh, I've been working with teachers for many, many years and what um, and I find myself lapsing into it as well, and that is putting up text and reading the text off the slide instead of, say, putting up just a singular image and then expanding discussion from there. We talked about chunking information. Um, the other thing that I have to watch out for is I tend to speak too quickly sometimes. I need to learn to slow it down. Um, even though you can record, I know in Zoom and possibly some other, I think uh, Cisco WebEx, you can, but even though they may be able to go back and view that recording, I'm still talking just as fast in that recording as I am, you know, during the session. Um, the other thing too is uh, tool selection, keep it small. Um, I saw some other folks in here. I think Ed Puzzle, somebody dropped in Ed Puzzle. That's a phenomenal piece, phenomenal piece Ed Puzzle is. Um, there's a lot of pre-made Ed Puzzles that might work with your content area. And, um, and then I wanted to share one piece with you uh, also about directions. One thing I've learned is because in the classroom, they're still all over at different attentions. We all know that. And the same holds true in, in our virtual classrooms. So when I give directions, I, I try very hard to give both verbal and written so that the verb, the slow, you know, the processing speed, and also say, for example, if I have a, I keep my haiku assessments password protected. So um, what I do is I share the screen with the password written as well as say it, because that makes a huge time, a huge difference. Wait time for 10 seconds. Um, the wait time has to be expanded until they learn some keyboard shortcuts. So, I mean, we all know about the historic five second wait time. Well, now we've got to really be a little bit more patient, really a little bit more, wait a little bit longer because they may be still trying to, they know, don't know the keyboard sh shortcut and they're trying to find out how do I, uh,
I'm slowing down uh, wait time. Before I turn this over back to everybody else's contributions, I'm so excited. I've learned so much tonight. I did want to tell you one thing I'm doing um, in the continuation of the rhetoric exercise. And that is that we're moving on to after they've made their commercials, they've written an argumentative essay. We're going on to letter from Birmingham jail, which I think is one of the most phenomenal pieces ever written. And I was worried about because it is rather long as important as it is kids can get lost in it. I found at common lit a one anybody use common lit in here, by the way. Isn't it awesome? It's really fabulous. Um, so that I'm having them go through um, the letter from Birmingham jail in common lit. And if you're not familiar with what it does is it embeds comprehension questions and also some higher order discussion questions where they can't quite see all the text until they've responded to some, un some comprehension questions and some discussion questions. I highly recommend Common Lit. You can set it up by class and the teacher has a dashboard in the back to see exactly how the student is progressing. I'm gonna open up the floor to everybody else. I mean, you guys are blowing me away with uh, everything in not only the chat box, but the crowdsource document. What other gems can you share with us today? Adding on to the uh, wait time, I know with um, online conversations that I've, I've had that sometimes even when the wait time expires, um, there, there's that awkwardness that comes with not wanting to be the first to speak, which exists in the classroom too. Um, so being very intentional with your listening and using probing questions um, or cognitive coaching style questions to really elicit response. So. Um, you know, if you hear somebody say a good nugget, ask them to kind of keep going to keep them talking. Um, and kind of like we would do in our classroom too, uh, random call is real. Um, you know, put somebody on the spot. If, if they know who's supposed to be talking, everybody else stops thinking. Um, and so that, those practices still exist in this environment too. Great. Thank you. Any other gems out there? Tips, strategies, techniques? Now, I'm not going to randomly call on anybody, just like Noah asked, you know, suggested. That's okay. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> but um, any other suggestions? And yes, do remember to unmute to speak. So grab the mic. So that's all I have to say um, tonight. And I want you to know that this time has been so beneficial to me. I can't wait to take some time and go through the crowdsource Google Doc um, more thoroughly. So I really appreciate your time tonight and thank you for your expertise. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm going to reshare here because Emily's contact information is here. If you want to get directly in contact with her for some additional information, I know she went through a long list of tools and resources for sure. And then also, if you are interested in getting in contact with me or those of us at CTQ, there are a number of ways that you can do that through social media, through our website, and my um, work email is also here on the screen. So I'm going to stop sharing, let everybody know that the recording of the session is going to be on the CTQ website where you registered. That registration link will change to a recording link and a link to the slides. I'll also put a link there to our crowdsourcing document um, are there any additional, uh, well, we'll hang on. 
if there are folks who want to have smaller group conversations or have any questions. Um, and if that's not the case, if you're going to bid us adieu, I'm going to say a very heartfelt thank you to Emily for taking us through our time together and sharing all these tools and also to you for take, spending some of your afternoon or evening depending upon your time zone with us we know you have lots and lots and lots of other things you could be doing so we really appreciate you taking some time today to join us all right good evening and we'll hang on for anybody else anybody who wants to hang on and have uh after the conversation conversations <laughs>